This conference will now be recorded.
I just heard from Katie. She's logging on now, so it should be shortly. <laughs> Um, Hello, Homer. Uh, Hello, Sarah and Christina. Can you all hear us? Yes. Can you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Our audio isn't working yet, but I will get there. Maybe. Hmm. Will you just say a couple sentences? Oh, that's the wrong one. Will you say a couple sentences? I'm going to toggle through our different speaker options. Hi, Katie. Can you hear me? <laughs> How about now? I'm talking. <laughs> Can you hear me? That one? No. Do it oh, in there. Spanish now. <laughs> Hola. Oh, okay, so that's coming out of the computer. Which is not <laughs> ideal, but it's not the worst. Let me see if I can twist it. Oh, that's why the Bluetooth speaker turned itself off. No, where is it? Okay, now say something really amazing. Hello, I am Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so Sarah and Christina, we have a room full of folks here. Um, I'm going to change it so that we can see you all and not see ourselves. Um, but we do have, Sarah, we have at least one of the questions for you before we begin. But I also haven't told folks, I told them a little bit about who you are, but um, not a ton because that seems sort of redundant, but that's I'm also realizing might make it difficult for us to ask questions. So we may have more questions at the end as well. I think, there we go. Okay. So, Terry, did you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, hopefully this will take you a space where I like. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Sarah? Yes. Okay. Um, my question was mostly um, concerning clams. And being new to Homer in the Bay Area, and uh, wondering when you are walking on the beach or you're digging the sand and you're seeing the clam shells, various sizes, and obviously different species of clams. But how? Because we can't clam to eat any clam, and I have yet to ever actually really see a living clam since I've been here. I'm wondering how you, like as a researcher, but also as a person walking the beach, how would you know when you see 
clam shells on the beach. Like how old they are, like are they very long time ago and it was pre when we you know couldn't you know, people could clam or if it's like a recent dead clam. And how you can how as a researcher would you determine the health of something that's under the sand? Like how how would someone tell you that you could go clamming and that there were clams there and you weren't seeing them? Um, so anyway, just like plan, general plan question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in at the we sample. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback on myself. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Is that okay? Okay, that seems better. I think that's okay now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we have four sites in Ketchumac Bay where we monitor clams, and they've been going down in numbers every year uh, since, I think, 2017. So they've just been going down and down at those four sites. Um, in terms of the shell litter, um, generally, if something doesn't have anything growing on it, then I would think it's pretty recent. Um, I did a study back when I was a PhD student in um, Ketchumac Bay where I looked at the shells and I separated them out, the shells of clams, whether they had been preyed on by sea stars or sea otters. And for that, I only picked up the clams that were like the most fresh, um, had like nothing on them. Um, those are the ones that I, and I, I looked at the same place every, I think it was every two weeks. So I was able to kind of clear all the shells from one area and then come back and, and clear them again. and be sure that that was kind of recent uh, shell litter. Um, and then just to know if there's if they're there or not, you know, if you see kind of squirting um, coming out of the sand, I remember back when I did some clam surveying there in 2013, I remember seeing um, some clams squirting out. And I think that it's just less common now as the, the clam numbers have gone down. But the sea otters are still eating a fair bit of clams in Ketchumac Bay. So they might just be uh, deeper than where we can dig for them. Uh, so in the subtitle, in the shallow subtitle, instead of in the inner title. Um, are you familiar with that shellfish hatchery in Seward? Oh, um, not very uh, familiar. I haven't really worked with them too much, no. I, I know that they were doing, they were seeking some uh, permits from ADF and G to see uh, particular beaches, uh, one in Port Graham, I know about. Uh, but they weren't really given uh, enough license to really see them. I mean, it was just really a sample study, which is so small. Uh, I wonder if you have you done any work on on what it might take to re-see uh, a clam beach, particularly uh, uh, steam and not razors, but they were doing uh, steamer clams. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, one thing that I've I've heard about recently is in um, I think it's in Jackaloff Bay that they're creating a clam garden and that could potentially help uh, to increase the number of clams there. And that's a site that is part of our monitoring. So we have years of data before this clam garden effort has started. And so hopefully we'll be able to see um, how that affects the number of clams. Um, I have a, another study that I won't talk about too much in, in this talk because it's uh, kind of still in progress where um, we look at the larval stages um, of the of some of these things and that includes um, bivalves which include the clams and they seem to be um, not uh, as abundant as they are in, um, in Prince William Sound. So it could be a, a limited uh, supply to the system and which seeding would help but um yeah i don't really know how much you would need to seed but it'd be interesting to see how that clam garden turns out uh, 
I couldn't quite hear that question. He, he was asking if uh, clam larvae are released into the water column or have a planktonic stage. Yeah, they do have a planktonic stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those that are curious about that clam garden project, it's being led by Philadelphia Village Tribe. Um, and I think they're, they're still in the process of figuring out the, the best approach and funding to do a pilot study there and kind of work with the PDF and G around whether there's actual like physical changes to the beach that need to happen to create better clam habitat from the exception drop off that are to be a really good clam habitat. Um, or if it's more um, they're talking about potentially putting like some sort of barricade at the entrance to try to keep the otters out. Um, and so some of that predator exclusion versus habitat um, modification and just sort of figuring out what the best approach is. And then um, that is a spot where they do have some, they have done some feeding um, quite a while ago, I think, with the Lizzie Tribe Marine Institute, um, with, I think, fairly kind of inconclusive results of how it wasn't unsuccessful, but also maybe wasn't quite as successful as they had hoped it would be. And so they're just trying to figure out other layers of support for the clam friends. Does anyone want to speak in one more question before uh, the official introduction of Sarah and launching into her presentation? How much clam are we going to play? Oh man, we're just, we are going down the clam, the clam hole here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I heard something about clam larvae, but can you repeat the question? How many larvae would a well, presumably two clams uh, <laughs> produce. And do you know much about sort of clam reproduction? And I imagine the, the male gametes are a lot more numerous than the female gametes. So maybe like how many eggs or is it um, internal fertilization and then release? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, I don't know. Millions? I don't know. That's a good question. I believe they're all broadcast spawning, so I don't think it's internal, but I'm not sure. So the female releases the larvae or the egg or the male fertilizes the seed. Yeah, so they, it's a very hands-off approach. Eggs go in the water, sperm goes in the water. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. We will have more questions for you, but we will uh, allow Christina to formally introduce you um, and get us kick started with our joint Cordova Homer endeavor. And we'll save our really hard clam questions for the end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one second. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is a really fun collaboration that we're doing with Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies in the Prince William Sound. So thank you, Sarah, for presenting to both audiences. Um, we today have a presentation from Sarah Traeger about the nearshore ecosystem. And Sarah works for uh, USGS and uh, does a lot of her research funded through Gulf Watch Alaska. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Sarah. Thank you, Christina, for that introduction. And I've got my thing in presenter mode. Can you see that? Yeah, it looks good. OK. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, everyone, for having me. And um, yeah, I work for US and my work is mainly in the uh, Gulf Watch Alaska Long-Term Monitoring Program. And so today I'll talk a bit about the recent changes that we have seen uh, as a result um, of this monitoring program. So first I'll give an overview of the Gulf Watch Alaska Program. 
And then I'll go into some detail about some of the things that we've seen in recent years. I'll talk a little bit about the sea star wasting epidemic. And then I'll talk about um, how mussels have responded to the sea star wasting. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit of detail on vertebrates, uh, some birds and sea otters in the near shore. Uh, so in 1989, the oil tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound, and it spilled 11 million gallons, gallons of oil. And that oil uh, spread through the Gulf of Alaska uh, in spring and summer of that year, and it reached the Alaska Peninsula. Um, just wondering, can you see my mouse as I move it around? Yes, yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it spread through the Gulf of Alaska. Okay. And 28 species were initially affected by the oil spill. And by about 20 years later, uh, many of those species had not fully recovered. Uh, and the recovered and unrecovered species spanned habitats from uh, intertidal communities to the pelagic zone. And it also spans trophic levels, um, species like mussels and clams uh, up to the higher trophic levels like killer whales. And the Gulf Watch Alaska program was established to maintain long-term data sets on injured resources and the habitats that they live in. And there's different components of this program. Uh, there's environmental drivers, the pelagic ecosystem, lingering oil and the nearshore environment. And I work in the nearshore environment mainly, so that's what I'll talk about today. The nearshore environment is a highly productive zone. We, in Alaska, we have rocky habitat as well as mixed substrate habitat. And we have primary producers uh, like macroalgaes, like large kelps, the rockweed fucus, and we have secondary consumers like mussels that form the base of a complex food web. And the Gulf Watch program, the nearshore component, uh, monitors four regions in the Gulf of Alaska, and these were all affected by the oil spill. Uh, Prince William Sound, of course, was the most um, heavily impacted by the oil spill, and that's we study uh, sites in the western part of Prince William Sound. And we also have sites in Kenai Fjords, Ketchumak Bay, and Katmai. And for this monitoring, we try to study, we try to monitor as many aspects of the nearshore ecosystem as we can. Uh, so we monitor intertidal temperature. We have uh, these temperature loggers that we have in little um, PVC tubes that are uh, connected to the rocks. And from that, we can get um, air temperature and water temperature. So if you're walking around the beaches and you see one of these things, this is what's inside. And we also count all of the uh, sessile or non-moving invertebrates and algae on the rocks. We also count the mobile invertebrates and we have um, predators like sea stars and snails. And we also have some grazers like the black chitin. And then we also monitor the vertebrates in the system. So for sea otters, we do a lot of work uh, on their diet. We watch them foraging and record what we see. And we also do transects on skiffs where we count all of the birds and mammals that we see. And for black oyster catchers, we also have some additional uh, monitoring we, that we do. We um, put tags on their legs and we also do some um, tracking of their location. One of the large disturbances that uh, we picked up with our monitoring and many other monitoring programs um, along the west coast of North America also saw this was the sea star wasting epidemic. Uh, sea star wasting is a disease that the sea stars can get where they develop these large uh, lesions on their bodies. And here's an Evisterius with uh, some wasting, and this is a Pisaster. And the body of the sea star basically melts away um, and it, it wastes away. 
and the Sea Star arms can fall off as well. And this appeared in 2013 in the lower 48, and it spread up and down the coast of North America, and it reached Alaska by about 2014, and then we started seeing large declines in sea stars. And one of the hardest hit species was the sunflower star, Pycnopodia. And this was listed as critically endangered by the IUCN in 2020. And it's currently been proposed uh, for a listing as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in the United States. Um, and on the left here is a picture of a large, uh, happy and healthy individual uh, that's digging a pit uh, digging for clams. These guys are a clam predator in Ketchumek Bay. And then on the right, this is a picture of a sunflower star that I took in Juneau uh, a year or two ago that has wasting. And it's got these big um, lesions on its arms. And you can see um, the inner organs coming out. And uh, some of the arms have also detached and are have moved away. So at our regions that we study in the Gulf Watch program, we saw these large declines in sea stars. Um, and the, this is a picture from Ketchumek Bay before the wasting. We had very large numbers in some places of Evisterius, and then they were reduced to much lower numbers. But the reduction of sea stars wasn't equal across all these regions. And I'll get into some, showing you some numbers on that later on, but um, just in general, the, there was a decline everywhere, but the decline wasn't as drastic in each region. And before the wasting, each of these different regions had distinctive sea star communities, but after the wasting, they were much more similar across regions. And uh, Michael Dawson, a professor at University of California Merced, led an effort to look at sea star wasting across the entire uh, coast of North America. And he uh, put together data from six different long-term monitoring programs, uh, including Gulf Watch Alaska and data from Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies. And uh, this map shows the coverage of data um, all the way from Mexico to Alaska. And with this, he was able to look at a lot of different species. He looked at 65 different species, and a lot of these are species that are um, less well studied. And one of the take homes from that was that we were able to look at the progression of sea star wasting across um, the geographic extent. And so this is a figure from that paper, and year is along the bottom. And the rows are different locations going from south to north. So uh, Point Conception in California is here. This is Oregon, Washington, and Alaska are these rows at the top. And the colors of the boxes are the percent incidence of sea star wasting. And where it's gray, there's no data. Um, so one thing that we is obvious is that there's not a lot of data from before this wasting happened. Um, <laughs> before we started noticing it, it wasn't something that everyone was looking for. Um, so now everyone's looking for it, which is, is good news, but we can't go back and, and fill in the holes necessarily. Um, we also noticed that the peak happens earlier uh, at the lower latitudes. So the, you're seeing more dark red and orange uh, in the early years down south, and then as you go north, um, the peaks in abundance, the peaks in occurrence are happening later. And we also are seeing sea star wasting that still persists um, many years after the initial peak. Um, years later, we're still seeing sea star wasting at a low level. So this is something that's just gonna be around likely for many years, uh, but at low levels. And we care about this because sea stars are keystone species. Their predation on mussels in particular has a big effect on intertidal biodiversity. This is a picture where there's a line of Pycnopodia, or I'm sorry, Pisaster sea stars uh, that graze on mussels. And below the, the sea stars 
there's a diverse assemblage of macroalgae and above them is a dense muscle bed. And so where they're able to eat the muscles, they free up more bare space that is colonized by um, a more diverse array of species. And they in part set the lower limit to this muscle bed. And this is another picture where you can see it on kind of a larger scale. So this kind of gray band here is the muscle zone. And so that you can see how the sea stars are really contributing to this zonation in the intertidal. So we wanted to know what the effect of this large scale removal of sea stars had on mussels. So we looked at these three species of sea stars that eat mussels. And we wanted to know with the removal of these uh, predators of mussels, of what was the impact on mussels? Was there a positive impact on mussels? But at the same time, there was another large scale disturbance happening. There was the Pacific Marine heat wave that lasted from 2014 to 2016. And this really overlapped with the sea star wasting um, in Alaska. And so how were these two disturbances affecting mussels? And we know that the Pacific Marine heat wave did affect the intertidal community. Um, this is a set of pictures from one of our monitoring sites in Prince William Sound. And what we saw was that during the heat wave, macroalgae declined. Uh, fucus and red algae in particular declined in their coverage and that left bare space that was then occupied by barnacles and mussels. So in these pictures, you can see our measuring tapes here. And in 2013, there's a lot of this olive green color and that's all fucus. And then in 2015, there's still fucus here. In 2017, it's really reduced. There's a lot more bare space. And by 2018, it's mostly all black and that's mussels. And still by 2019, there's still a lot of mussels and not nearly as much fucus as there was back in 2013. And we care about these mussels because they are an important part of the food web. Uh, they are secondary consumers. They eat primary producers like phytoplankton and detritus from macroalgae. And then mussels are then in turn prey for vertebrate consumers like black oyster catchers and sea otters. This is a, a black oyster catcher with a mussel in its beak. And these guys also bring uh, prey back to their chicks. So the chicks are also getting mussels. And this is a, a sea otter with a really large clump of mussels that it's eating. So our research questions were, how has muscle abundance changed since the sea star wasting outbreak? And which sea star species and temperature metrics best explain variation in muscle abundance? So these are our areas that we were studying and we had five, um, five sites in each location, in each region. And they've been monitored since about 25, 2005 in some places. And we also looked at sea star density. So for sea star density, we do a swath. We count all of the sea stars um, in a particular area. And that area starts at the, um, at the water line at zero tide. And we search four meters up the beach and then for a distance of 50 meters along the beach. So that gives us an area of 200 square meters, and that's roughly equivalent to 2,100 square feet. And so you can kind of think of that as the square footage in kind of a medium large house. Um, so as we go into talking about numbers that we're seeing, you can think about um, how many numbers of, how many sea stars you might find in the floor, on the floor in your whole house. And again, we are just looking at the three species that are muscle eating sea stars. Uh, we also have intertidal temperature. And for this, we can separate out uh, air temperature and water temperature. And then we have a few different metrics that we use to measure the 
amount of muscles. This is a picture of a muscle site um, with our measuring tape going through the muscle bed. And we look at muscle bed width. So for that, we measure the distance from the highest muscle on the beach to the lowest muscle on the beach, closest to the water. And we do that measurement for um, 10 different spots along the muscle bed and average that. We also have muscle density. So at random points in the muscle bed, we'll put down a quadrat and collect all of the muscles in that spot. And then later we'll um, count all of them and measure them. And then we also have muscle percent cover. So for this, we have a gridded quadrat and we put this down and you can see that there's little um, like fishing line uh, that forms a grid. And at each of the crosses in the grid, we'll look at everything that's directly under that point. So we're looking at all of the layers. So if there's fucus, there might also be uh, barnacles or muscles underneath that. And that gets entered directly into a computer. Um, and that's very helpful because this is um, gathers a lot of data through this method. So it makes it much quicker to enter it straight in the computer. Okay, so we saw declines in sea star density across regions. So here I'm showing each of these different plots is a different region. And we have Katmai, Ketchumak Bay, Kenai Fjords, and Western Prince William Sound. On the bottom, we have pre-sea star wasting and post-sea star wasting. The colors of the points correspond to our three muscle-eating sea stars. And on the vertical axis, it's the number of sea stars per 200 square meters. So again, that's roughly equivalent to 2,100 square feet. Um, so, and the where the lines are connecting the two points, that's where there was a significant, a statistically significant decline in the sea stars. So in Katmai, we had a significant decline in all three species. In Ketchumac Bay, we had a significant decline just of Evisterius. In Kenai Fjords and Prince William Sound, there was a significant decline only in Pycnopodia. And another thing I want to point out here is the, the numbers on the vertical axes are different between the different regions. So in Ketchumac Bay, before wasting uh, in your whole house, you might have gotten 12 or 13 Evisterius. And then post wasting, you're getting none in your house. Whereas in Prince William Sound, before wasting, you were maybe getting 22 or 23 Pycnopodia. And there is a big reduction. You're finding fewer post wasting, but you're still finding maybe eight or nine Pycnopodia. So it's, um, it's nearly as many as you were getting in Ketchumac Bay even before the wasting. Um, and it's similar with Kenai Fjords. Uh, there was a decline in Pisaster, but it wasn't a statistically significant decline. So there are still sea stars present in these areas, um, in Kenai Fjords and Western Prince William Sound in particular. Okay, now we're going to look at how mussels were affected. So here I'm showing again pre-sea star wasting and post-sea star wasting but now the colors of the points correspond to the regions. So Katmai is in red, Ketchumac Bay, Kenai Fjords, and Prince William Sound. And again, when the, where there's a line connecting the points, that's where it was a statistically significant increase. So first looking at muscle bed width, that's where we measure the distance from the highest muscle to the lowest muscle. There was an increase only in Katmai. For muscle density, we have density of large muscles and then density of all sizes of muscles. And here we only have a significant increase in the density of large muscles. And part of why we separate this out is because these large muscles are the ones that are really being eaten by things like sea otters and black oyster catchers. So we're interested specifically in those large muscles. And then we have percent cover. Um, and we have percent cover in the mid intertidal and in the upper intertidal. At the mid intertidal, there was an increase in percent cover 
everywhere except for Prince William Sound. And at the upper intertidal, there was a significant increase in muscle percent cover everywhere. And now looking more at that last panel where there was a significant increase in percent cover in the upper uh, intertidal, we can look at them as a time series as well. So now I'm showing each panel is a different region. We've got year along the bottom and the red box is the years of the Pacific Marine heat wave. And the dashed line is when sea star wasting appeared in each of these different regions. And one thing that you can notice is that the increase in muscles was often one or two years delayed behind the wasting and the heat wave. So for Katmai, we started to get an increase in 2018. In Ketchumik Bay, it's a pretty gradual increase. In Kenai Fjords, it's also increasing afterwards after these two disturbance events. And at Prince William Sound, it's actually starting a little earlier and it's a pretty modest, pretty small increase, uh, especially compared to some of these other regions. And it's understandable that we have this delay in the response of muscles because uh, muscles have a two-part life history where they have a pelagic larvae that settles out into the inner tidal. And then it takes some time for those muscles to grow up and take up more space in the inner tidal and for um, that to translate into more percent cover of muscles. So we wanted to know which of these um, factors is best explaining the variation in muscle metrics. So we looked at the total numbers of sea stars as well as the proportion of each species of sea stars. And then we looked at several different temperature metrics. And we found that what was really important was the total number of sea stars, and it didn't actually matter which species were there. Uh, but the total number of sea stars was most related to um, these different muscle metrics. And then we didn't find any strong evidence for direct effects of temperature on the muscle metrics. So the combined disturbances of the heat wave and the sea star wasting outbreak resulted in an increase in muscles across the Gulf of Alaska that may have been larger and lasted longer than if only one of the events had occurred. The heat wave had a positive effect on muscles through this indirect effect on the macroalgae. The heat wave uh, led to a decline in macroalgae, which then opened up available space for mussels to colonize. And we also found some indirect or some uh, evidence of positive effects of higher winter temperatures on mussels. So uh, less freezing events during the, sea, during the Pacific marine heat wave may have benefited them and they may have been uh, less stressed and had lower mortality during the heat wave. And while those that was going on, then we also had the sea star wasting. And this led to an increase in survival of mussels because they were uh, being, one of their major predators was taken out. Um, and this we could see especially at the lower tidal elevation. And this change in the inner tidal really represents a functional shift uh, in terms of the prey that's available to higher trophic levels. Um, so this is a picture of China Poot comparing it in 2013 and 2019, where it's uh, quite a pavement of mussels in that year. And so this abundance of mussels could have an effect on higher trophic levels that consume them. And so we were interested in how this heat wave affects on the prey affected the predators. Now, before we talk about um, these two groups, the nearshore predators, I want to take a slight uh, detour into the pelagic environment. So in the pelagic ecosystem, there were clear effects of the heat wave. There was a large decline in forage fish, uh, including herring, capelin, and sandlands, and that led to declines in 
birds and mammals in the pelagic zone. So there were declines in humpback whales and there were large die-offs of seabirds. So when their prey declined, the predators also um, had declines. And so how were the nearshore predators affected? So we looked at benthivorous marine birds. And so these are birds that are uh, specifically feeding in the benthos on things like mussels and clams and limpets. And um, so we looked at all of these species and the Barrow's golden eye and black oyster catcher in particular uh, rely on mussels a lot. So here we're showing um, time series of this group of birds in Katmai and is the first row and Kenai Fjords in the second row. And the dashed line is the onset of the, of the Pacific marine heat wave. So the blue points are pre heat wave and the red points are during and post heat wave. And we have data for summer and winter. And you can see that there really isn't much of a change between before and after the heat wave. Um, the numbers are pretty stable. Um, there's not really big declines or increases um, for this category of birds. And that's likely because their prey was overall fairly stable. We did have a decline of clams, but it was a pretty small decline. And we also had an increase in limpets and mussels. So this is a really quite a big contrast to what's happening in the pelagic environment where we have these big decreases. But in the intertidal, um, these species seem to be um, more robust to these changes in temperature. So then we wanted to know how sea otter diets have shifted um, and have that shift, has that increase in mussels affected their diets? So I'll talk a little bit about how we collect data on sea otter diets and our two main uh, methods that we use are foraging observations and looking at their spring. And to give you an idea of, of how we do this, this is a picture of a sea otter with a very tiny little uh, sea urchin in its paws. So we're quite lucky with sea otters. They're a unique marine mammal in that they everything they eat, they bring to the surface and they eat their prey on the surface. So ideally and theoretically, we should be able to see everything they're eating and be able to record uh, every prey item that they get. So we spend a lot of time collecting these data. It's a time intensive um, method, but it's we get quite a lot out of these data. We climb up onto headlands or islands, and ideally we want an area where we have a full 360 view of the water around us. Um, and that really depends on the location, whether we can achieve that. Uh, but we want to be up somewhere high so we have a good view around us. And if it's a, if we get really lucky, it's a nice day like this, and it's nice and sunny and calm. Uh, but we also get some some rain and more challenging conditions. Um, so first, we will sit up there and we'll use binoculars to find a sea otter that's foraging. And once someone we see someone that's foraging, we'll watch them through the spotting scope. And this is actually a scope for uh, looking at stars and planets, but we use it for sea otters. And we'll watch them for up to an hour or at least 20 bouts, 20 bouts of, of foraging that we're trying to get. And if we're in a place where there's not a lot going on, we might have two people watching the same otter to uh, train each other and make sure that we are calling the same data. Uh, but oftentimes we'll have uh, people watching separate otters. We're mostly restricted to doing this in the summer, um, and that's just because it, it takes a lot of uh, time and resources to get out to these locations, um, and as well as the weather. Um, it's easier to do this in the summer. So that restricts um, what we know about the sea otter diets. We're also limited by the locations we can set up a scope. Um, so it has to be, we have to watch otters that are, um, you know, somewhat close to land 
Uh, and sometimes they do forage in places where they're very far from any land. And uh, we do occasionally do this uh, method from boats, but that's very challenging because the then you have the sea otter that's moving and also the observer that's moving at the same time. So it's a challenge to stay um, to keep the scope on one individual. So sometimes, we'll most often do that if the boat is uh, anchored and it's very calm conditions and the boat has to be uh, with the motor not running because if the motor's running, then it shakes the scope um, and that makes it challenging as well. So when a sea otter comes up with uh, its prey, we try to estimate the size and identify every single prey item that it has. And so this is a picture of our size guide. And we base we have this uh, categories of size based on the size of a typical sea otter paw. So we kind of estimate whether it's you know smaller than one paw, larger than a paw, larger than two paws, and so on. And we try to identify the prey that they have to the lowest taxonomic level as possible. Um, and sometimes we can do that when we see like a green sea urchin. Sometimes we can tell that this are, these are butter clams, but other times um, we just get things that are completely unknown. We can't tell at all what it is. And sometimes we go to pretty broad categories like clam. And this is a picture of a female with a pup, and that's very often what we're seeing. We also keep track of how many how much of each prey item is given to the pup. And sometimes we also have uh, males come through and steal food and we keep track of that as well. One of the benefits of this method is that we get information on prey that is soft bodied. Um, so that doesn't, I'll mention later how that doesn't show up in the sprint. Um, there's no uh, remains of that in the sprint, but we are able to see that in the visual visible uh, observations. Um, and we see them eat things like um, sea stars, sea cucumbers, and octopus. And often with octopus, it takes them a very long time to eat that. OK, so our other method is spray. So sea otters spend most of their time in the water, but they do haul out on land. And they, they poop in, on land. They also poop in the water, but when they poop on land, then we're able to, uh, months later, go to that spot and look through the sprite. Um, so we'll go to these locations, these haul outs, where they tend to uh, like to haul out. And we'll look through each sprite and try to determine what was in it. And sometimes we might have a sprite like this, which is pretty much all uh, muscles. It's the blue muscle. And we can tell just by the kind of crunched up blue and black shell that's in the spring. And other times we might have a sprint like this where it's kind of a mixture of different things. It's maybe half muscles. And then this we would have to look at more closely, but this is probably a mixture of, it could be clams. Uh, we also see uh, sand dollars. We see crabs, limpets, chitons. We even see fish bones sometimes. Um, so we try to determine what's in those sprites. Uh, but again, there are things that are likely not showing up in the sprite, but they do eat. Um, so things like octopus and sea cucumbers. And there are some things that are more likely to be in the sprite than others. So with mussels, especially for small mussels, they'll just eat the whole mussel. Um, but for things like a big clam, they'll open the clam up and eat the inside. And you might get a shell fragment along with that, but um, not as much shell as you get when you're just eating whole mussels. Okay, so now looking at how the mussels in the diet vary by region. So on this uh, left panel, this data is based on the foraging observations. And on the right panel, these data are based on the spring. Along the bottom here, we have the different regions, uh, Katmai, Ketchumac Bay, Kenai Fjords, and Western Prince William Sound. And the colors correspond to different prey categories. And we just kept it simple here, looking at clams, 
muscles, and everything else. And what we see here is that clams are usually number one in what they're eating. Uh, but in Kenai Fjords, it's actually mussels that's number one. And in uh, Ketchumik Bay, we also have uh, mussels, but this is based on um, quite a few fewer years of data. So we, we feel like we need some more years of data to get a good handle on that. Uh, for Sprint, again, uh, clams shows up as being really important in Katmai, uh, but mussels are also showing up as being important in um, Ketchumik Bay, Kenai Fjords, and at Prince William Sound, it's kind of even with clams. So now looking at how diets shifted specifically in Katmai. Um, so going back to when we were looking at the number of mussels pre and post sea star wasting, this was the one area where Katmai was the one area where there was an increase in the density of these large mussels. So I pulled out just the Katmai data here. This is looking at the sprint uh, over time. The red is when the, the heat, waste, heat wave years and the dashed line is when sea star wasting appeared. And you can see there's quite an increase in the proportion of spray that has mussels in it um, after this period of the heat wave and the sea star wasting. When we look at the foraging data, we don't have much data before the wasting um, and the heat wave uh, to look at right now, but we do have um, you know, some higher levels, but it's not nearly as dramatic a change as we saw in the sprite. So some of the reasons behind why we see different results using these two methods um, could in part be due to the differences in the biases between these methods that I mentioned before, but it could also be related to the life history of the muscles. So uh, mussels are developing their gonads in the winter and in the spring. And this is actually a picture of a sea urchin gonad. I couldn't really find any pictures I liked of mussel gonads, but it's kind of the same idea that, you know, people eat uh, sea urchins when they have nice, big, ripe gonads. Um, and they're not really, people aren't interested in eating sea urchins when they're empty and don't have gonads. And so it could be similar for sea, sea otters where the mussels are a more high calorie, uh, higher quality food in the winter and spring when they have ripe gonads. And when we're looking at them with this method, with the visual method in the summer, that might be a less preferred prey item at that time of year. I've spent most of this presentation talking about mussels, and we can learn a lot about the nearshore ecosystem from looking at mussels. They compete with other species in the intertidal, and they're an important prey species. But we wouldn't really understand how the nearshore is being affected by big events like the heat wave and sea star wasting without monitoring uh, across all the different trophic levels that we have in the nearshore. So if you'd like to learn uh, more about the Gulf Watch program and especially hear about things besides mussels, uh, and if you're in Homer, you can come to the Ketchmek Bay Science Conference. Uh, and I'll be giving a talk on barnacle larvae variability and relationships to intertidal abundance in Ketchmek Bay. Um, so this might be of interest if you have um, boats or other gear in the water that you want to prevent uh, from having uh, barnacles settling on um, because I'll talk a bit about the seasonality of the larval stages of the barnacles and how that relates back to uh, abundance in the intertidal. And then I'll also be standing by a poster um, that is kind of an overview of the nearshore program and talks about some of these long-term changes that we've seen. Uh, this nearshore monitoring program is a big collaboration across uh, many different organizations. Uh, I'm with USGS and there's a lot of folks at USGS that works on this. Uh, National Park Service, NOAA, University of Alaska Fairbanks, and US Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, if you'd like to find 
links to any of the papers that I've referenced, you can uh, look on my homepage. And that's also got my contact info. If there's any, pa any papers that you can't find uh, free online, you can always email me and I'd be happy to send you a copy. Um, thanks for listening and I'll take questions if we've got time. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, does anyone here in Cordova have a question? Yeah. I know that they that you're saying muscles mostly, but I was just wondering how the sea star wastage started. Like what caused it? Yeah, that is a good question that we also still don't entirely know the answer to. Um, they, it could be a virus that is contributing to it. And there's some recent research that looked at the surface of the sea, store, sea stars and the kind of um, bacterial environment on the sea stars. And there might be a relationship between the amount of organic material that is in the environment and then the bacteria that respond to that and create low oxygen environment at the surface of the sea star, which then leads to these lesions on the body. Um, so it's still not entirely known, but there could be some interaction between um, viruses, bacteria, and there's also some indication that environmental stress like higher temperatures and particularly in Alaska and, and further and northern latitudes that um, increased fresh water also contributed to these outbreaks. Great. Let's go ahead, Scott. So how old is a large muscle? Hmm. We so we did some tagging surveys of mussels to try to look at their growth rate, and we lost a lot of our tagged mussels. Um, <laughs> but they we found that they uh, another student looked at um, the growth rings on the mussels and looked at how much they were able to grow just in the last year um, by looking at. The, the distance to their kind of most recent growth ring. So yeah, that's kind of a long way of saying, I don't really know, but probably several years, I would think. Um, I think they can grow to the size that they're of interest to most of the predators. So about um, two centimeters in probably a year or two. I'm not sure, they don't, we don't get ones of the blue muscle that are much bigger than, um, you know, maybe six centimeters. So they're pretty small compared to some other species like um, uh, the California mussel. Those get really big. Um, but yeah, so our, our biggest ones are, are not really all that big. They might be several years old. Any other questions? Yeah. What's up? How long would a starfish live? Do they have a... Yeah, so the for Pycnopodia in particular, the sunflower star, there's a lot of interest in that with the um, with how badly it was impacted by the wasting and how it hasn't really bounced back like a lot of other species have. And um, some recent work has gone into trying to figure out when they first reproduce. Um, and that seems to be about five years old. And so kind of a mid-sized one that you see might be, you know, five years old. And they've also been in aquaria for a very long time. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how long, but, you know, probably a lot longer than they last out in the wild. But I th think there are specific ones that have been kept alive in aquaria for, you know, more than a decade. Go ahead. It's pretty amazing that um, sea otters have, I just looked it up, they have their own name for their poop. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I, I fish around here and stuff, and I don't see a lot of sea otters up on the rocks, you know, and maybe floating in rafts out in the water. So it's kind of, 
is it more of an exception finding them up on rocks? I mean, they're kind of, I'd say, prey themselves, at least compared to in the water. So it's just amazing to see you're, you're counting, what do you call it, sprayed? Sprayed, yeah. Sprayed. That's why I don't do that. <laughs> um, but finding that up on the rocks is a, is a yeah, it just seems kind of odd to me to find it up. Yeah, we, we scientists like our jargon, so we just have to have a specific name that only applies to sea otter poop. Um, but yeah, they the sea otters, I also, in the summer, I don't see them hauled out very often. Um, and when I do, the times that I've seen it in person, it's been like a small rock that is not going to be dry. Like that's an intertidal rock, and they're out there on... Uh, a low tide taking a little rest. Um, but they do do it more in, uh, in the winter when it's rough. And I would, I would think that it's different in, um, in different regions. So maybe they do it less in places like Ketchumak Bay where there's kind of more boat traffic and maybe people traffic. Um, and we do have less data on the spray in places like Ketchumak Bay. Uh, than we do in Katmai, which is quite remote. Um, in Katmai, there's places where um, we go every year. We call those like haul out locations, and we'll find um, 20 sprints easily. Um, and in Katmai, also, uh, another aspect of the sea otters that we uh, survey that I didn't mention before is we walk beaches looking for uh, sea otter skulls or sea otter whole carcasses, but particularly the skulls because then we can do um, aging and, and things like that with them. Um, and in Katmai, we very often will find sea otter carcasses in bear beds, and we think that um, the bears are predating the sea otters when they're hauled out. Um, and last year, um, when researchers were out doing surveys in uh, the winter, they saw a bear that was not hibernating and it was very big and fat and happy. And so it could be just snacking on sea otters all winter long. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. When I, when I was a kid, I remember um, we brought this muscle in. We said it was from Middleton Island, but that thing was like a foot long. I don't know for, I mean, it might have just been messing with me or, but this thing was huge. So I just, predators maybe? I don't know. They're, they're just kind of. Yeah, have you ever seen a muscle that long, Sarah? Yeah, the, yeah, so I'm like looking around my office to see if I have any shells. I don't think so. My big mussel shell is at my house, but the the California mussels are are much much bigger than the blue mussels that we have in most places. And we do have um, like there's one site that I know of in Kenai Fjords where we have those um, California mussels. They are kind of mixed in sometimes, and they look pretty distinctive. The California mussels have pretty big like ridges on them whereas the blue mussels are, are generally more smooth. Um, so yeah, it could have been that California mussel. Um, I'm gonna turn the questions over to Homer. Katie, we can't hear you. <laughs> nope, no sound yet. How about, can you hear me now? We're using the we can hear you. Yeah. 
Okay, Alan, why don't you come up to the computer because the oh. fancy one stopped working when we got kicked out of GoToMeeting. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello. Oh, good. I, I'm just curious about, uh, you referenced uh, the warming cycle that we had in 2013, or, and uh, I'm wondering if you're taking into account the, you know, like for instance, the episodic changes that we see in the temperatures, like in Catchback Bay 2019, as where it was a, a pretty warm year as it, were, as it was, you know, in many other parts of the state. So wondering if that's taken in, you know, if you're, how that plays into your, your work. And then the other thing I was kind of curious about, you mentioned uh, about the foraging fish, the herring and the coca pods and, and the other uh, foraging fish that you, I think you said it was in the decline. And I'm just wondering about if there's a base layer on that, a base, base, on that um, that biomass of foraging fish, and, and if that's being tracked, um, those are uh, some other questions I have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the foraging fish. That's also from uh, different components of the Gulf Watch program. So that's also um, kind of based off of long-term monitoring uh, on the foraging fish, uh, the forage fish. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what the baseline numbers are for forage fish, but there's been there was a dramatic, pretty dramatic decline in those um, during the heat wave and after the heat wave. And for the 2019 also, you know, increase in temperature, I don't really know yet how things were affected by that. It seems like the sea stars are mostly kind of coming back gradually, and that 2019 increase in heat. Um, didn't really seem to affect them too much. Um, Ketchumik Bay is kind of the main place where we're not seeing that much recovery at the specific sites that we survey. There's certainly sea stars in other locations within Ketchumik Bay. Um, and then for for mussels as well, they seem to um, kind of be increasing in some places. The fucus seem to be uh, coming back kind of despite that 2019 heat wave. Um, so the, the Pacific Marine heat wave, that was kind of a really big event in that it lasted for so long. Um, so that seems to have a, had a, quite a big impact on the system, uh, more so than kind of the one year 2019 heat wave. Um, but as we go on um, and these heat waves become more and more frequent, it'll be really interesting to see how that affects the system. Have that, you know, because I think what we're, or at least myself, what I'm noticing in Catchment Bay is that the the bay is is uh, staying warmer uh, longer through the summer. And as far as the what personally I've observed as far as the rebuilding of the sea stars, is that in places of current mm -hmm. uh, where there's a lot of current, like in the lagoon entrances, uh, around certain rocky outcrops. Uh, you know, there's one outcrop that we see a lot of the uh, sun stars, you know, and small ones and big ones and kind of a, a, a diversity of size. But, um, you know, like in 2016, one thing that we had happen that was very unusual for the bay was uh, uh, we had a, a, a group of humpbacks come into the bay that stayed for, you know, a long time. I think they came to the bay like some part the end of June and they didn't leave till like November. And um, there was about 30 of them thereabouts. And uh, there was just a huge amount of feed in the bay. And I haven't seen that much amount of feed. I mean, you could see it in the water. Uh, and we haven't been able to see that amount, at least I haven't been able to see that amount of feed that supported that, that humpback population that came in for so long. But the temperature through the summer, um, it used to be when the bay got over 50 degrees, it was a big thing. Now it's a normal, you know, and we don't see the feed balls. We don't see the whale activity till it cools down. So I don't know, anecdotal observations from a neurotic water taxi driver. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be a great title for a book. Is that, is that, is that, is that covered up? <laughs> But the, yeah, the yeah. the changes in the the temperature 
yeah, with the seasonality, that's really, really interesting too. And, and that's something that we're looking at with the larval stages too. And, you know, whether it's, you know, staying warmer earlier or getting warmer earlier and how that affects the like barnacle larvae settling out um, because at higher temperatures, they could be moving through their um, larval stages faster. And if you have um, recruitment out of the pelagic zone faster and you get things settling at an earlier date onto your boats or your, um, you know, gear that's in the water earlier, um, that could be related to changes in temperature, um, the seasonality of those temperature changes. It, just a little follow up and I'll shut up. It would be, it would be really interesting uh, to network with some of the food study analysis are, uh, on pink salmon and when those smolts are released and when the certain bivalves are releasing their larvae and what the, the impact of the smoke release is to the availability of food that's around. It would be, because it's kind of a growing area of, of interest, I would say. So thanks a lot. Your work's really important. I, I liked your presentation. Thanks. Sarah, we have one more question here in Cordova. Scott. Great. Uh, I was going to mention, Sarah, in the Gulf of Alaska, the herring population only declined in Prince William Sound. Every other mm. monitoring population increased during that time period. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's kind of like with the, all, all the other things, it's... um. Sometimes you don't see the same effects across all of these different regions. Are there any other questions? Anybody? We, we've got one here, Christina and Sarah. That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. So I know down in the lower 48, there's been a lot of research in how the loss of the Pycnopodia and the Pisaster has been affecting the ecosystems. And it's led to a massive overgrowth in the um, urchin populations. And I know relatively recently, they've actually started culling the urchins to protect the, um, the algae growth. Is there anything like 